Week five of Lent has begun. Yeah, fifth week, which means we're, it's uh, two weeks until Holy or one week until Holy Week, right? Now I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there's there's been a lot going on in the United Methodist Church over the past few years, and most especially over the past few weeks. Uh, there's a discussion that's going on. Uh, that has been going on at general conference and at annual conferences of the UMC about how we should respond to the LGBTQ community. First, I want you to know that I'm not going to be speaking towards that today. I will, however, bring up an important announcement that was made, made a few weeks ago. In response to the divide over other topics, there has been in the works a new denomination of the Methodist Church called the Global Methodist Church being formed that was due to establish after the delayed 2020 General Conference met this year. However, earlier this month, they announced that the General Conference, uh, the 2020 General Conference will not be held, and the General Conference will be held again in 2024. At this news, the Global Methodist Church announced that they will officially form on May 1st this year, ahead of the annual conferences this year. There's a lot of information about this in the Texas Annual Conference website and on the United Methodist Church website, and I invite you to read on this um, because it's very likely that in the future our church will have to make a decision regarding all of this. Which brings us to the message today. Where do we stand? What is it that we believe? I don't think it's a coincidence that these developments happen during the season of Lent. The time, this is a time of waiting and reflecting. It's a time of spiritual growth. So as we reflect on the future of our church, and what it is that we believe, I pray that we are here to hear a message about the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you speak to us today. In this world, there are so many directions that we can be pulled so many ways that we can serve. Sometimes it gets confusing. There's mergers and divisions among denominations. And, and God, sometimes we don't know what we want to do. And it hurts to change this way sometimes. So we ask you today to, to deliver us so a deliver some message that will, will guide us in how we respond. How do we personally follow you? Speak to our hearts today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The letter to the Philippians. It's a remarkable letter. It's, it's, it's just it's a beautiful, beautiful letter that Paul wrote. Uh, the church at Philippi was actually one of the first churches that Paul founded, if not the very first. Well, of course, we don't know that for sure, but we know that it was very early in his career that the church at Philippi was formed. <laughs> of course, Paul has since moved on and formed other churches by the time he writes this letter. And right at this time, he's actually enduring one of his imprisonments. We don't know which one. We just know that he's enduring an imprisonment. So where is Philippi? Well, everybody knows that, right? Everybody, well, Philippi, if you know where Greece is, it's in the, the northeastern part of Greece, kind of where Turkey is. It's, it's, it, it could either be Turkey or Greece, depending on the, 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 deck, or the, the century that you're in. But, um, but it's right there in the northeastern part, and it's right smack dab in the middle of the Roman Empire. Now, of course... Being under Roman rule, preaching that Jesus was the one true king creates controversy, right? 
Because if you're a Roman citizen, who is king? Caesar, right? Caesar's king. So going and telling people that the that Jesus is the king, that, that kind of creates some controversy and, uh, and kind of creates opportunity for you to be persecuted by the Romans who honored Caesar as their one true king. And though he stood against mounting resistance to this message about, about Jesus, some of the citizens of Philippi listened to Paul. And some of them formed a church. And after this foundation is, uh, is built in this church, Paul leaves. And he goes on to, to form more churches because that's how God had called him. But after he leaves, two things happen. First, the new Jesus followers, of course, they're spreading this, this message that Jesus is the one true king, right? The Lord of lords. And they begin to be persecuted. Surprise, surprise, right? And, the Jesus, and, then, uh, and Jesus' followers from outside of the city then come in, and they start sharing a different message. This really sets up Paul's letter. The people of Philippi, what they had done is they sent a representative of the church to Paul in prison to bring him a gift to, to help him in his ministry and through his imprisonment. And then the representative, while he was there, tells him, oh, by the way, this stuff is going on at home. Right? So in the beginning of the letter, Paul addresses the persecution and points out that he himself is still being persecuted. And he's in prison, literally writing them a letter saying, you want a persecution? I have been in prison. I've been tortured. I've been, yeah, I get it. You're still doing the work of God. And even though I'm in prison, I can still do the work of God. And he, and he says that he even converted one of his guards to believe in Jesus Christ, to follow Jesus Christ. And, uh, and though that is significant, it's not the part of the letter that we're examining today, right? That's the first and second chapter. Our part of the scripture is examining this contrary gospel that has been brought to these uh, believers in Philippi from, from uh, what, what they call interlopers uh, from other part of the, uh, of the country, the world, whatever. So what is this message that they're, that they're saying? Well, they're saying that if you want to be a Christian, then first you need to be a Jew. Because Jesus was a Jew. So if Jesus was a Jew, then you need to be a Jew before you can be a Christian. And to be a Jew, you need to do all the Jewish customs, right? You need to celebrate Passover. You need to learn the, uh, the law of Torah and the Talmud. <laughs> you need to atone for your sins the way it says in the scripture to atone for your sins as, as it's ordered by the law. And if you're a man, you need to be circumcised. The last one's a little bit more difficult for some. I mean... <laughs> I imagine that part was a bit hard to swallow. But basically, to be a part of the Christian community, you need to go and do good things that God has commanded you to do so that your goodness will outweigh the bad, uh, uh, bad for you so that you may receive a blessing from Christ. Is there a problem with that message? There's a big problem with that message, right? Well, Paul tells the people of Philippi that the laws were in place so that the chosen people of God, those people that God set apart, that they can literally be set apart from the rest. Essentially, if you were to go anywhere in the world and you found a person who was Jewish, you would know they were Jewish. You would know they were Jewish. I mean, in a polytheistic world, that means many gods, many uh, uh, worshiping many gods, there are uh, where most religions believe in multiple gods, and in a world that's accepting to all these different religions, one could tell that they were a Jew because the Jewish people, uh, because of how they looked, how they behaved, how they ate, and how they worshiped. They were the only ones that were worshiping one true God. Now, it's not a bad 
message to say that you should do this. I've said that before, right? Doing good things is good. Period. Right? If you go feed a homeless person, that's a good thing, and it's something you should do. The problem comes when you begin to measure goodness over bad. If we look in our lives and recognize that there's more bad than good, and we measure ourselves against others, we begin to feel inferior. If we measure our goodness and decide that our goodness is more than our bad, and we measure ourselves against others, we begin to become self-righteous. Basically, what we talked about last week in the prodigal of the parable of the son, a parable of the prodigal son, right? So here is Paul, and this is where Paul completely destroys this message of goodness over badness. And I love what he says here. He says, if someone else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, okay? If someone else believes that they have reason to put confidence in the things that they have done as a human being, I have more. And then he starts naming off things. Circumcised on the eighth day. Not just circumcised. Circumcised as the scripture declares you should be. Uh, uh, on the, uh, as the people of Israel, and not just that, as the tribe of Benjamin, he can trace his lineage all the way to Israel and his son Benjamin. A Hebrew of Hebrews, and in regarding to the law of Pharisee, not just a regular Jew, somebody who had, who had memorized the scripture, a Pharisee. And as for zeal, one who persecuted the church, and as for righteousness, Based on the law, faultless, blameless. According to the Jewish community, he was without sin. Basically, he's saying that he's done everything right in the eyes of the Jewish community to grant God favor. He had committed a massive portion of the scriptures to memory. He, uh, he has adhered to all the customs and the laws of the church as instructed in scripture. He is a high-ranking Pharisee. He was the one that was sent by the Pharisees to go persecute the church, the church of uh, Jesus followers. And if there ever was a person that can call themselves a Jew, it was Paul. He was like the perfect example. He's the perfect Jew. And then he says this, For whatever gain were gains to me, I now consider them a law. For the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. And he says, What is more, I consider everything lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. He's saying, All the riches and the fame and the notoriety and everything I had is gone. He says, Everything I had is nothing compared to knowing Jesus Christ. And then he says, I love this next line, I consider them garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness that comes from the law, which comes through the faith in Jesus Christ. That is amazing, isn't it? All the good that he's done, all the laws that he has kept, all the way he has proven himself to God is garbage compared to knowing Jesus Christ and the grace that Christ has for him. Wow. He says he wants to know Jesus. And then he says he wants to know Jesus to the point that he can experience what Jesus did to bring him that grace. What did Jesus do to do that? He went to the cross. He says he's willing to go to the cross for the sake of Christ. He says, I pray that I can experience that. Who prays that? You know, I, I didn't wake up this morning and say, God, sever my legs just so that I can see what it's like to be an amputee. I didn't say that. I didn't say, God, put me on the cross for Easter just so that I can experience what it's like to be 
like you. Who prays that? He said, I want to suffer like Jesus did. Now, I don't think that's what he's really saying. What he's saying is that if he had the opportunity to suffer that way, he would. Because there's nothing else in the world that he can do to repay what Christ has done for him. Paul says that our role is to rejoice in what the Lord Jesus has done on the cross. Compared to that, everything else we have done ever for God is nothing. We can never repay that. Now these interlopers, these visitors with this different gospel, that came to Philippi were saying that they need needed to be like Jews before they can do, uh, before they can be a Christian. Before they know what it means to be a Christian, they need to know what it means to be a Jew. They, they were saying that they need to be more religious to receive God's grace. Well, I'm here to tell you they are wrong. They are absolutely wrong. In fact, I don't ever want to be religious. I am not a religious person. I am in relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. What these interlopers were saying is to be a Christian, you need to know Jesus and this other thing. You need to know Jesus and be a Jew. Now, there's still people in the churches today that will tell you this same message. They'll preach this message then you need to believe in Jesus Christ and be a Republican. Or you need to be in, uh, believe in Jesus Christ and be a Democrat. You need to believe in Jesus Christ and speak in tongues. You need to believe in Jesus Christ and give us all your money. If you want to be truly saved, you need to be, believe in Jesus Christ and do this thing. But they're missing the point. That's not the gospel at all. That's not the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is not to be a better Christian by doing things for the church or doing religious acts so that you can be counted as good. The goal of the Christian life is not to do good things at all. The goal of the Christian life is to know Jesus, period. That's the goal of the Christian life. And there were so many of us that have problems, and you know, I, I say this, uh, I say this because there's something. This is something that we all, that I, I, I believe all of us struggle with. I, I know this is something that I struggle with, and why I'm speaking about it today. My life gets so busy now that I'm a pastor because of the church that I'm serving. I do a lot of things that I can say I do for God because I'm a pastor. It's my job to do right. It's not so other people can say, yeah, look at Kevin, he's a good Christian. It's because of what Christ has done for me. And the only thing that Jesus wants to return for this gift of salvation is for me to really know him. And sometimes I get so busy doing the things for the church that I forget. I need to work on that relationship. I need to work on my relationship with Jesus. I mean, this is what Paul is saying to the church. This is what I'm saying to you today. I mean, what good is it if you're religious and you have no relationship with God? I mean, how well does your relation, how does your, well does your marriage work if there's no relationship? How, well, how good is your family? If you have no relationship with your family. What about at work? If you have no relationship with your co-workers. How, how enjoyable is work? If it won't work for those things, then it won't work in the church either. If you have no relationship with Christ, then you're missing the whole point. Because everything else you can do is garbage compared to knowing Jesus. Call out to Jesus. Learn about 
about his life and his messages in Scripture. Surround yourself by other people who love Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him. And above all, give Jesus praise for the work that he has done, the work that we will celebrate in a few weeks. This is how much Jesus loves you. And it's not important what we do. It's all about how we know Jesus. Amen?